Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship, Mile. And thank you for having me and, and um, just inviting me to be to be here virtually, as it were. This is really quite cool. I've, I've um, gotten to know the things that uh, Mile, the Medina Institute, is doing. It's been really, really um, exciting. And, and for me, what's interesting is the the book, the most recent book, and, and today is about sort of how leaders build organizations that are more creative and more innovative. The interesting thing for me is that I started out as a, as a straight leadership guy. I, I did my uh, graduate school work and my doctoral program is in strategy and in leadership and in leadership issues. And when I started wanting to um, write a book, I actually, I started out thinking I was going to write a straight leadership book. What I wanted to do was examine the leadership practices of these incredibly innovative companies and see what the senior leadership team of these companies were, were doing that made them so great. And what I found was that I really, um, I had trouble figuring out if you went back to the early days of starting the company, the early startup days, I had a really hard time figuring out uh, what those innovative companies had that presumably non-creative or non-innovative companies had. In other words, they had all the same raw material, right? At Apple, who I, who just bailed us out of our technical difficulties here, Apple's an incredibly innovative, creative company now, but when they first started, they had the same resources as all of the other computer companies. So what was it about that? And and being a, um, an academic, being a researcher, I tried to figure that out in a way that's quantifiable, uh, and I failed. I really couldn't find some quantitative measurement of what leadership attributes correlate to creativity and innovation. There was some research, uh, but ultimately I couldn't get anything that I really um, thought was tangible to the level that I wanted it to be. And so I went back and I looked through a lot of different interviews that I had done with leaders, with middle managers, with uh, individual contributors of, of organizations, and I started to read the transcripts of the interviews. Couldn't really find anything measurable in survey data, so I started reading the transcripts. And what I found was that whenever I was reading a transcript from someone that worked for one of these innovative creative companies, it, it read just a little bit differently than someone who wasn't fully exercising their creativity. They used different terms to talk about it. So, you know, the, the the innovative companies just talked about it like it was sort of every day. There was a process they had to go through uh, and it was just part of their work life. But this, presumably the people who weren't um, fully exercising their creativity, not, not getting the innovation of, out of their people, they used different terms. They would still talk about almost the way that we talk about it and romanticize creativity. They would talk about how ideas just came to them, and you, and you can't see it, but I'm doing the uh, the American style air quotes um, to to highlight the sarcasm and just came to them. The the irony being, where was the idea before it just came to you? Did it did it come from somewhere in the ether and was downloaded to your brain, or did it come out of your brain? Um, or they would say things like, I just don't feel inspired, which in in the Western tradition that comes from the the word inspired comes from the Greek root that means breathed upon. Uh, they would they would talk about they, very few people still believe in the ancient Greek idea of, of nine muses and all of that that comes from mythology, but people still talked about it with this sort of romanticized um, almost difficult to approach um, difficult to approach uh, language and that became really really difficult because I, on the other hand, I had all of these other people who were telling me just about their everyday life, like coming up with incredibly disruptive, innovative ideas was just part of their normal day. And so trying to reconcile that, I came to this realization, and it's true for creativity, but it's true for a variety of fields, and, and the realization is that the, the stories that we tell ourselves are true, even if they're not true. The stories that we tell ourselves about how we operate, about how our, the potential that our company has, about our people, about our families, about our children, about ourselves, the stories that we tell ourselves are true because they become true, even if they're not true. So uh, in, in psychology, this is referred to as a confirmation bias. And what confirmation bias essentially says is you will selectively filter in or filter out information that confirms what you already believe. Uh, I like to use the examples of um, if you're looking to, to purchase an automobile or purchase a house or purchase anything that's a big decision and you're having to think through the decision. Um, several years ago, my wife and I were looking to buy a car. It was a big decision. And then when we had picked the one that we wanted to buy, suddenly I saw that car being driven around everywhere. 
And it wasn't that the, the universe had conspired to magically put more cars in front of me. What happened was that I was selectively filtering in information about the cars around me that before I was filtering out because I wanted to see that car more often, right? And so you, you do this in the form of stories over the time. If you consistently tell yourself you're not creative, you consistently tell yourself that your team or your company is not innovative like those other ones, you will look for information that confirms to that worldview or that um, that disconfirms that worldview. You'll filter out information that, that disconfirms that worldview. And so this is where the idea of the title of myths of creativity came from. If you look back into any tradition, myths are stories, very old stories, that we use to try and describe something mysterious, something we don't fully understand. And in a lot of situations, that they, these can be really helpful, right? They give us a framework for sort of uh, reaffirming values in a community. They give us a framework for sharing culture, even inside of organizations. Most companies that have been around for longer than 10 years or so have the sort of legendary stories of, of the founder or uh, of a really great employee. They have these sort of myths, in other words. The problem happens when those myths start to, from creativity's sake, the problem happens when those myths start to um, play off this confirmation bias and allow people to look for evidence that confirms or disconfirms an, uh, their point of view. The problem happens when the myths that we're telling become true even when they're not true. And so what I try and do in the book, The Myths of Creativity, is take aim at what I felt like were the ten most common incorrect stories that people were telling themselves and that were damaging themselves and their organization's ability to be creative or be um, innovative. And so what, what I want to do today in the time that we have together is, is go through what I feel like are the most common uh, five. There are ten in the book, uh, but we'll go through the most common five, and I'll tell you about where this myth comes from, the research that, that uh, usually goes against it, and even some examples of the companies that are that are in line with the truth and not in line with the myth. And so to do that first I want to I want to take a pause and talk about we we I, I joked at this earlier people use this discussion about um, cr creativity coming from somewhere else even if it, it instead of coming from inside of you and I want to show you a quick um, chart or quick graph and this is a, a visual depiction of where a creative idea where an innovative idea comes from. Uh, there's some research by a woman by the name of Teresa Immobile. She's a researcher at the Harvard Business School. She's a, she's a very good person, too. She and I have had several conversations in writing this book and in after this book. She's a, a, a wonderful person. So if you ever get the chance to meet her, she's awesome. So shout out to Teresa. Um, she says there are four factors. And I know what everybody is thinking. There are, um, there are f three, three circles on the screen, but I said four factors. We'll get to that. There are four factors that, when they align, a creative insight happens. Uh, expertise, creative thinking, motivation, and I'll tell you the fourth in a second. Expertise applies to our subject matter. If we're looking to start a company in a certain field, we have to know a little bit about that field. If we're looking to build uh, a bridge or a tower, we have to know a little bit about physics and understand how gravity works and how to, how to build a large structure, um, keeping in mind all of the forces of physics. Right? No matter what field you're in, you have to know a little bit about it. You can't be a total novice and have an idea that is new and useful. At the same time, interestingly enough, we'll talk about this in a second, too much expertise can actually be inhibiting, but we'll talk about how that is down the road. The, the second factor, creative thinking, this is creative thinking skills. This is a skill set that you can develop, that you can work your team through. So when I think about creative thinking techniques, the most common one that, that people talk about is the brainstorming technique, which is just one of a variety of different techniques. And, and the real skill is not in knowing when to use certain techniques to come up with great ideas, uh, the, or, or is not using certain techniques. The real skill is knowing when to use which one, knowing what part of the process you're in of developing an idea, developing a product, developing a marketing plan, and when you need to tap into what skill. Sometimes that means you need to get into a room and brainstorm. Other times that means, as we'll talk about here in a couple of minutes, other times that means you need to step back and incubate, which is itself is a skill. The third uh, factor in the circles is motivation. You have to actually want to solve the problem you want to solve, right? And that seems fairly um, obvious, but at, at the same time, so often we think that we can, especially when we bring employees into the picture, we think that we can impart, entrepreneurs think a lot of times we can impart our same intrinsic motivation into employees by just making sure they're incentivized properly and we're offering the right amount of funds, money, et cetera. Um, and the, the research supports the idea that intrinsic motivation, that thing that you're inspired to bring into the world through sheer internal motivation is much more powerful than, than extrinsic motivation. It is possible to get the two aligned, to, to um, align an employee or your own compensation to line up with your intrinsic motivation. It takes a lot of work. It's a whole lot harder than most people do. And then 
the fourth factor, the one you, I'm sure you're all looking at and thinking, okay, what is the fourth one? If you think about the blue field behind these three circles, the fourth factor is the social environment, the environment of the entire firm or the, the um, culture that that person is steeped in. So inside of a company, the social environment answers questions like, uh, do, do your employees feel free to share ideas across the entire company, or do they keep their ideas to themselves and have these uh, silos where no information goes in or goes out of certain departments? Do your employees feel like they, or do you feel like you have the ability to take risks? Right? I, I think a lot of places taking a step out and taking a risk and trying hard is, the, is seen as the first step to failure. But in reality, it's the first step to learning. Because whether you win or you lose, you learn something about your marketplace, your organization, et cetera. So when you take a risk, in my opinion, it's never, it's never win or lose, it's win or learn. Uh, but, but that's an example of that social environment. Some companies are set up in such a way that the person who sticks their neck out first gets it chopped off, as it were. Um, the people who take risks, that's the first step to failure. So this social environment becomes really, really important for making sure we have the right culture that supports these ideas. We can have these three circles in play, and ideas can come, out, can come up. People can think up new creative ideas, new innovative um, marketing programs, et cetera. But if we don't have the social environment, then we'll never see that those ideas implemented on an organizational level. And we'll talk about the very last myth addresses that social environment. So we'll talk about that in a second. That's sort of my surprise finish for you all, if, as it were. But first, I want to delve into what I think is the most common uh, um, cultural myth that I see around creativity, innovation, and, and what most people use to discount their own abilities to be creative, which I think is really interesting. I call it the Eureka myth, and it comes from that, um, that ancient, not, not so ancient, but that Greek story about Archimedes and the bathtub. The, the story essentially goes that Archimedes was looking for a way to solve uh, whether or not a crown from the king was made out of pure gold or was just gold-plated, and he was thinking through and working on the problem, and then he decided to take a break and took a bath. And as he was getting to the bath, some of the water spilled over, and he realized he could use water displacement to, to measure the mass of the object. And suddenly, he had this grand idea, and, he, and the story goes that he was shouting Eureka all the way as he was running naked into the king's um, chamber. Now, I don't, I don't think that story ever happened. I couldn't find very many research to support it. The only written down, or the earliest written down record of that story happened 200 years after the Archimedes story would have happened. Um, and, and the same thing is true for, in the West, one of the most common Eureka stories is Isaac Newton, the Englishman, and the apple. Right? So Isaac Newton is sitting under an apple tree, an apple falls and hits him on the head, and suddenly he comes up with this idea for gravity, which is how most people tell the story, but it's not really how the story happened. The earliest written record of that story essentially goes that Isaac Newton is sitting with one of his mentees. Isaac Newton is mentoring this man by the name of William Stuckley, who's writing down this interaction. And they're having dinner, and then they're having tea afterwards in the garden, and, and Newton points to an apple that has already fallen on the ground. And he says that the same force that compels this apple to the ground must be the force that keeps planetary bodies in motion. It must be um, how we can explain why things move around in the solar system without crashing into each other gravity. But there is no grand revelation there. What, what Newton is really just sharing is here's an idea that I'm working on. Here's an idea that's sort of churning in my mind. It's not a grand flash of this sort of revelation. And what's interesting, I think these stories aren't necessarily true. They're, they're sort of half-truths. They're myths, if you will. But they still resonate with us. Every one of us has had one of those times where we think of some idea for something, and it just feels like um, a revelation. It just feels like a eureka moment. It feels like it came from nowhere, and now we're elated because we have this new idea. And that's not to say that that, and I'm not discounting that feeling. What I'm interested in is where does that feeling come from, and how does that idea uh, come up out of this sort of supposedly not thinking about it. And there's a researcher who's done a lot of great work in this in, in setting the foundation for what would become known as a process called incubation. Uh, his name is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, which is an incredibly interesting name. Uh, I think you can score points in any party at any dinner if you're trying to sound like you're really intelligent, if you just say Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. And what Csikszentmihalyi came up with was a five-stage process to explain creativity. So in essence, what he did was he looked at incredibly creative people in a variety of fields, and he asked all of them a very open-ended question. He said, describe to me your creative process. And then he would write down their answers, and he would look at, at the similarities and the parallels between all of their answers, and what he found was that most of the people he surveyed, 70-plus people, 
that, that were the pinnacle uh, creative people in their fields, most of them had the same five-stage process. You see it represented here visually. Um, the first stage was uh, preparation. They were working on a problem. They were working on a project. The second stage was incubation. They stepped back out of that project for a little while and, and focused on something else or took a break, uh, took a vacation, took a sabbatical, whatever it was. The third step was insight, and this was that sort of feeling of eureka moment. Right after the incubation period, they either, in the, incub in the midst of the incubation period, had a new idea, or right when they returned from it, they engaged in a creative thinking technique that brought out a bunch of new ideas. And that was that third stage, that's insight. But even then, they're still not out of the woods. The fourth stage is evaluation, and the fifth stage is externalization uh, or presentation. So the fifth stage is actually bringing that idea out in the world, getting feedback. And interestingly, then the cycle starts again because you have more feedback and start it over again. And I want to drill down on these, this stage two and stage three because this is what I think explains that feeling of eureka, that feeling of elation as we come up with this grand moment. What's happening in incubation, we think, is that our subconscious mind is sort of selectively forgetting information. If you've ever worked on a really hard problem trying to get a, um, a new product up or just trying to figure out the, the right model, et cetera, you're working on a really difficult problem. Sometimes you find yourself, uh, at least I do, sometimes you find yourself thinking up the same wrong answer every time. Every time you try and solve a problem, you end up going down the same pathway, and then you realize you, you've already thought of that, you've already tried that, that's not going to work. What the incubation period, some, some researchers think, and, and this resonates with me, is you, you selectively forget all of those wrong pathways that your mind is going down, and it opens up the field in your mind to explore new possibilities. What's interesting is the research doesn't say that you need to take a bath like Archimedes or sit under an apple tree like Isaac Newton. The research simply says you just need to focus on something else. And it can be a total break, and you can take a vacation, you can take a walk, you can take a shower, you can take whatever, uh, or you can just switch to a different project. Uh, and, and the research says that the uh, effect on incubation is the same. Even, as, uh, even switching to a different task for as little as five minutes, you'll have more ideas and you'll have a better quality ideas when you return to the task at hand and try and solve it after a period of incubation uh, than if you just tried to plow through and ignore stage two and go right to having the insight. It's hard to force that without that, that period of incubation. Now, in my own life, what I actually use this for um, is email. So I find most emails that I send and receive to be relatively mindless. I don't have to focus too much. I'm usually confirming dates or making appointments uh, or, or just sort of um, thinking through a quick four or five sentence reply. I'm not working on the really deep stuff that I have to work on in my career, writing, practicing speeches, uh, preparing lectures at the university. All of those things take a kind of a higher level mental function. Email, on the other hand, meh, it's relatively easy. And so what I've done is I've turned off all the notifications on my, my cellular phone that sends me emails. I don't, my computers don't actually check for email. I have to go in and manually check for email. And what that does is it saves it all up so that um, when I'm ready, when I need a period of incubation, I can go to my email inbox and I can engage in, in responding to some email for 10, 15, 20 minutes, never more than 30 minutes, and then I can turn back to the problem at hand and I've had it given my mind a break. I've had this sort of period of incubation. And it's been really, really helpful for me for coming up with those new ideas. And a lot of times what you see is this is the same thing that the creatives in, in Chicks and the High study were doing. And truthfully, this is the same thing a lot of, I, I've met a lot of um, entrepreneurs, people like a Jack Dorsey who founded Twitter and founded Square, I feel like he's actually using two different companies to incubate each other. So during, he, if you ask him about his process, in the mornings he's at Twitter, in the afternoons he's at Square. So in the mornings he's incubating on the problems at Square that he'll head and try and solve in the afternoon, and then in the afternoon he's incubating on the problems he's trying to solve at Twitter as he moves forward. Now he might not ever use that to describe it, but knowing what I know about Chick Sent Me High's research, I can definitely see that benefit there. So I, I encourage you to, to think about where you can put this into your life and your normal workflow that just gives you time to step back from a problem, switch to something else, so that when you return to it or when your team as a whole returns to it, you will end up um, coming up with far better and far more ideas for solving your problems than, than before. And you'll also understand where that elated feeling of eureka usually comes from. It means that you had some period of incubation and then you had the insight. But you're still not out of the woods yet. Remember we said earlier, there's a, there's a variety of myths, and one of them is around this idea of expertise. One of the circles that I presented to you earlier was expertise, and I said that expertise is important, but
but too much of it can actually be a bad thing. And this is what I usually call the expert myth. And I find this actually interestingly, especially with entrepreneurs, I find that sometimes when we work on a problem, when we're working on a situation in our, in our startup, and we run into a problem, who do we inevitably look to? We look to experts. We look to people who have been in that industry longer than us for extended periods of time, and we try and get their advice. And there, there's nothing against that that's usually very valid. But I think uh, on some level we have to understand the limits of expertise. Because the, we would think that the, the chain of creative ideas or innovative ideas, right, as your expertise goes up, the, the line of creative ideas and innovative ideas you have, the sheer number of them also goes up. But that usually doesn't happen in a lot of people's careers. And we've looked at this in a variety of academic fields, a variety of business fields, and what we find is that usually as, excuse me, usually as expertise goes up, uh, creative output goes up for, to a point and then it goes back down. Uh, my favorite example of this is in, in physics, in the domain of physics. There's a joke that if you don't do Nobel Prize winning research by the time you're 30, you should retire and you should stop doing research because you're just wasting your time. And I think this is really interesting because 30 is, 30 is really young for an academic. This is, if you think about, especially in the UK and the United States, around 30, that's usually your first or second year having finally finished all of your doctoral studies, finally have um, a, a full-time professor job at a major university. That's right when you're starting out your research career. But the truth is it's actually, I mean, it's true. If you look at uh, the ages of the people who won the Nobel Prize in physics, when they published the study, when they published the paper that won them the Nobel Prize, they tend to aggregate around 30, 31 years old. And we've tried to figure out a bunch of different explanations for this, and, and I think the most valid comes from a, a researcher by the name of Dean Keith Simington. And what he did is he actually, he's actually found this sort of inverted U between expertise and creativity as it goes up. Sometimes the creative output, the number of new ideas can go up. And what he explains it is that to have a truly creative idea and to have a disruptive innovation, to have an a, a idea for a company that's just going to be groundbreaking, you have to have a bunch of ideas and you have to, have to, have to elaborate on a bunch of ideas. Now, in, in Simonton's words, that is an ideation rate and an elaboration rate. You have to come up with a bunch of ideas and you also have to elaborate on a bunch of ideas. And as expertise goes up, the ideation rate goes up. As you learn more, you come up with more and more ideas. But paradoxically, the elaboration rate, the number of ideas you're willing to take risks on and try out and, and see if they'll work, that number usually goes down. So the more expertise you have, the, the more ideas you have, but the less ideas you act on. And his theory, and I think it's a really valid one, is that what's happening is that, because I think it resonates with a lot of us, his theory of what's happening is that as you come up with these ideas and you have a bunch of expertise, you figure out the reasons why your idea would never work, and so you never try it. Right? You, you figure out, you sort of talk yourself out of even trying the idea because you're smart, you're an expert, or the other person's an expert, and they'll tell you how it never works or how it's, we've always done it this way, et cetera. I think we've all run into that resistance of we've always done it this way. This is, how, this is just how it is. This is how it works. Um, I think that's really, really, really intriguing because when you look at, to use a different Nobel Prize, the Nobel Prize in medicine, one of my favorite stories that proves this is true is, is uh, ulcers or um, you know, lesions in the stomach that cause a lot of pain. For a long time in medicine, we thought those were caused by acid or stress. If you had a lot of stress in your life, clearly you needed to take a break. That's why you had the ulcer. And if we, if we lower the acidity level in the stomach and if we... we get you to stress out less, maybe take an Archimedes-style bath. If we get you to stress out less, then we can cure the ulcer. Uh, it didn't really work all that well. And then these two gentlemen from Australia came along and said, we think it's caused by a bacteria. Uh, specifically, the bacteria is named H. pylori. My, my wife is a physician, and that's the only reason she, that I know that. Um, but we think it's caused by a bacteria. And so what, uh, what they did, the, the whole medical community said, no, we know what it is. We're, we're experts in this. We know it's caused by stress. And they really thought, they, they had the ideation rate, but they didn't know enough to know why it wouldn't work. They, they figured that it's worth a shot, so they tried it. The only people they could try it on were themselves. One of the two gentlemen, one of the two doctors, actually drank a vial of this bacteria. So drank the bacteria that causes ulcers and photographed his stomach every day and watched as the ulcers uh, developed. 
And then when they had developed sufficiently, he then drank a vial of uh, antibiotics to kill all of the bacteria and watched as the ulcers went away. And they presented that to the medical community, and suddenly the medical community switched, pivoted. Right? For, for so long, their expertise had blinded them from seeing that this new idea had merit. They just didn't even want to try it out because it didn't fit with their current framework. And then when they had proof, it was really easy to say, yeah, maybe this is true. And we now know that, that most ulcers, most lesions in the stomach uh, are caused by H. pylori, and we have a, a much better way to treat it than just try and lower the acidity level and lower your stress level. And it's all because of two uh, doctors in, the, in Australia who knew enough to come up with the idea, but didn't know so much that they decided never to try the idea. And I think this is really interesting for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons is I encourage um, a lot of people to, uh, to, to really leverage this, to make sure that their expertise never in, encounters uh, and inhibits their creative output, I encourage them to become what uh, a lot of people refer to as being T-shaped. So this is a, a design thinking term. It actually comes out of the consulting firm McKinsey & Company. But the idea is you need an ex a level of expertise. You need a deep level of expertise in some area. And that would be like the vertical of this letter T that you're all looking at. At the same time, you also need to cultivate a working knowledge of a lot of other fields. It's not enough just to know um, about your field and be an expert in your field. You need to be able to look at the peripherals and see what else is going on in fields like you. Because when you study a lot of um, disruptive innovations, they usually happen because someone saw something on the periphery and tried and applied it to their expertise or took their expertise and brought it to a new field where that wasn't necessarily being used. Uh, I think one of the best examples of this T-shaped idea, um, Reed Hastings, the entrepreneur who founded the, the company Netflix. In the United States, Netflix appeared out of nowhere, overtook the incumbent uh, movie rental company Blockbuster in a matter of years. Uh, and it was all over for Blockbuster. And the reason they did that was they were fed up with the, the retail model of renting movies, and they looked at a, a periphery, right? They understood how movies worked. They understood how the rental world worked, how to get licenses to rent things. They had some deep level of expertise. But they looked at the periphery, and they saw that magazine subscriptions and other subscription services had a constant stream of revenue that worked really, really well. And they said, well, what if we do it, what if we do it that way? What if instead of having you come to a store and using the store as the business model for movies, for renting movies, what if we use the magazine model? So what if we bring the magazine model out from the periphery and apply it to our area of expertise and you have this idea of Netflix? And what I really appreciate about Reed Hastings and the rest of that company is that they were so T-shaped that even as internet connectivity was growing and the ability to stream movies were online, they saw now a different field. They looked at places like um, a lot of the peer-to-peer -peer networks where people were almost illegally downloading movies and figured and used that same sort of technology but did it in a realm that was legal using movie licenses, et cetera, and now are um, usually, if you look at bandwidth charts, especially in the evenings in the United States, they are the, the most trafficked. Um, website in terms of bandwidth coming and going t to users. Uh, they're, they're the most trafficked website uh, out there. They, they take more bandwidth than almost anyone else out there. The reason is that, again, they were T-shaped. And I, I have faith that at some point when the model shifts again, the leaders of that uh, startup, the leaders of, of Netflix, are T-shaped enough to be able to see that on the periphery and apply it to their level of expertise and avoid that level of disruption. Um, you can do this in your own personal life too. I encourage people a lot of times to uh, either engage in hobbies or find people who engage in hobbies that uh, you don't normally engage in. Talk to people outside your normal of ex expertise. One of the really um, hard things about any level of, of success, whether that's as a startup or inside of a large company, is that the world will naturally push you to know more and more about a narrower and narrower subject. And so in order to become T-shaped, you have to really take a deliberate effort to learn about a variety of different fields. Um, ironically, you know, you have to do things like attending webinars on creativity or attending um, whatever webinars are bringing out. You have to do things like reading outside your normal area of domain. One of the things I really liked about um, the community that you've all allowed me to be a part of today is that it's a community that's, that's around that. We're, we're going to look for a variety of different information we're going to cultivate it. So stay plugged in with them, and they'll help make you uh, even more T-shaped. So a couple of the myths um, just to sort of tap into, because this one I think is especially damaging to entrepreneurs, because so often we tell stories of loan creators, loan entrepreneurs. Uh, earlier I talked about Jack Dorsey, who founded Twitter and founded Square, which is a payment processing company. 
Uh, in both cases, we tend to tell the story like it was all about Jack. In reality, in both cases, he started a company with uh, multiple people. I, I just talked about er, earlier about how my the fact that I had an Apple MacBook set up next to my office computer saved us and allowed us to be able to do this uh, webinar. Um, we talk about Steve Jobs, uh, the founder of Apple, all the time. We very rarely talk about Steve Wozniak in the early days, who was the 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 partner to Jobs and allowed him to, to develop this idea. Without, without both Steves, as it were, we wouldn't have Apple. We also very rarely, until Steve Jobs passed away, we very rarely paid a lot of attention to Johnny Ive, the more recent designer that Jobs had a really strong partnership with as he was developing things like the iPhone and other groundbreaking technologies. Even in, if you think back in history, right? Uh, we think to people in, in the States, we think to legendary people like Thomas Edison, who invented the light bulb, but not really because 20 other people invented the light bulb. Um, or we think um, to people like Henry Ford, who invented the automobile, not really because a lot of other people invented the automobile. And in both the cases of Ford and um, Edison, both of them had teams. So Thomas Edison, I, I believe his greatest invention was actually a place called Menlo Park, Menlo Park, uh, New Jersey. What it essentially was is after he made a little bit of money, he built a workshop and invited um, a variety of people together to come together and to collaborate on projects with him, which I thought was absolutely, uh, I think is absolutely wonderful. Uh, because what would happen is they didn't all work on one project at a time. They were all working on a variety of stuff and they would move in and out uh, of a variety of different fields. And it, it actually, intriguingly, it actually resonates with where some in interesting research on how to plug yourself into the networks that Edison built has been done. Um, that, that research actually comes from the world of um, Broadway plays, of shows. And um, this is a study by Brian Uzi and Jarrett Spiro. If you look at their study, they say if you look at any show, any musical show that, that happens on a stage in the theater, any of those shows, there are six people on the senior leadership team, a composer, a librettist, lyricist, choreographer, director, producer, you don't need to know what those are. The, the point is there are six of them. And in, in some cases, those six people have all worked together. So if you think about that as like the black dots on the screen, they've all worked together. In some cases, some people have worked together and others are brand new, like the red dots in, on the, in the middle one. And in some cases, the entire team is brand new. And what Uzi and Spiro wanted to do is figure out which of these is sort of the best composition, knowing that we need more than one person to drive the success of a company, of a project, et cetera. What's the best combination of new people and old people? And I think this is really interesting because when I give this and ask people to, to do a show of hands, some people want to put their money on tried and true teams of, of new connections or of old connections that have been around forever. Some people want to put it all, all on brand new and have the diversity that comes with that. Some people want to hedge their bets and put it in the middle. Uh, and what's interesting is it is sort of in the middle. If you think of it on a scale of one to five, most people want to put their money on three. But the truth is what Uzi and Spiro found is 2.6. I have no idea what the significance, I don't know how you have a point a point six person is, um, but their point is that you need just a few more new connections than you do old connections. Because if you have an equal number, I think if you have an equal number, what can end up happening is that the old connections say, we've always done it this way, and you run into those challenges of expertise that we just talked about. What I think is most interesting, I had the chance to talk to one of the two researchers, Brian Uzi, who, who did this study, and I asked him, what's the lesson of, or what's the most um, misunderstood lesson of your study? He said, most people think that it's about forming a 2.6 team one time and then going off. So that's not what we studied. We studied networks. We studied the entire uh, Broadway ecosystem as one network. Because if you build a team that is perfectly diverse of old colleagues and new colleagues, if you build a perfect 2.6 team, the longer they work together, the more they slide from the middle to the all to the all black dots, the more they slide to all old connections, and you end up stifling those same ideas. So the real lesson is how do you not how do you build the 2.16, but how do you put yourself into a network? where you have the ability to always rotate in new voices, so you're always getting fresh. Right? And I think there are two lessons especially for entrepreneurs here. Um, number one, so often we like to tell success stories as if it was one person against the world, um, and it's not true. And I think that's damaging because it can make you think that if you're working really hard on a problem and it's not working, then it's because you are not good enough. And that's not true at all. The truth is that almost every person who started a company that changed the world had help. Creativity, innovation, they're team sports. They involve having a team. And the second lesson in that regard of team is it's not about having the same team all the time. It's about having a constantly fresh team, a 2.6 team all the time. And so as an entrepreneur, as a leader, you have to ask yourself, 
it's important to have some trusted old colleagues, but what are you doing to put yourself in a network that allows you to hear new voices at the same time as you have those old colleagues? So I think that's one of the, the most interesting lessons. And, and then the very last one we'll cover, I'm, I'm going to skip right to it because it deals with that social environment. The very last one is what I call the mousetrap myth. And it comes from, there's this, this phrase that I hear often, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. And the problem I have with this phrase is that it's not true. Um, even the actual mousetrap uh, in the, in the um, states, almost every time I ask someone to picture a mousetrap, they picture the wooden board, a spring-loaded trap like you see in the movies and on cartoons and all of those. That's a really old mousetrap. That was invented over 100 years ago. And there are about, uh, there, there, every year there are about 400 entrepreneurs, inventors who want to build better mousetraps. And we ignore most of them. Um, there's only about 19, 20 other competitors to that wooden mousetrap. And some of them are actually better. Some of them really are better mousetraps. But we always think about that wooden board with the spring um, and the cheese. Although, as I'm learning peanut butter, I, I gave a talk once to a group of pest control entrepreneurs and uh, people who literally chase mice. And they said that peanut butter works better than cheese, which I was, wrote that down as an incredibly useful tidbit that I got out of going to that conference. Um, but, the, but the world is full of this and not just the mousetrap. So we were talking earlier about Apple. Um, I'm staring at a MacBook Air running this presentation. And it had not been for the fact that Xerox invented the personal computer and then didn't recognize its potential and allowed Apple to develop it, we wouldn't, I wouldn't have the technology that's in front of me allowing me to communicate with you. Uh, the same thing happened in cameras. Kodak, the, the legendary film company, developed the digital camera, didn't see the value in it, chose to sort of shutter it away. I think especially for entrepreneurs, this is a really dangerous myth because we believe if we can just get the product out there, if we can just get the world to see how great our idea is, then clearly they will beat a path to our door. All our troubles will be over if we can just get a product, product out there. But there's a lot more to that. See, we talked about creativity earlier, and I, I kept using these uh, similar phrases, novelty and usefulness to come up with creative ideas. Um, they have to be new, but you also have to be able to judge their expertise. That's the pro or they have to judge their value using expertise. That's the expertise myth. Um, all of that stems from the idea that for an idea to be a disruptive innovation, it has to be new, and it has to be, it has to be seen as valuable to the world. And the challenge is that if an idea is new, it departs from the status quo, it departs from what the world or the community is used to. And all they have to go on to judge value, the second part of that, is whether or not, um, is their past experiences, and whether or not it resonates with something in their past experiences. And it turns out that we as humans, no matter what the culture, no matter what the country, we are really bad at reconciling those two ideas. If something is new, it departs from the very status quo we're using to judge whether or not it's valuable. And the more uncertainty you introduce into an organization or a culture, the more often uh, we fail to reconcile these things. And so we say we want new ideas. We say we want creative ideas. We say we want innovative ideas. And yet so often we are um, struck by this bias against those same creative ideas that when we think about them as trying to judge their value, it's hard to see that sort of value. So from an entrepreneur standpoint, I think we have to think through not only what can we do to um, build a better product, what can we do to build a better company, but also how do we communicate the message that this product is a logical extension of the status quo, it is a logical improvement on the status quo, and if you just give it a small shot and lower the barrier to entry of even trying it, you'll see the value of it. Even more so as leaders, especially as our companies grow and we're leading and we're getting ideas from other people in the company, not just from ourselves, it's really important that we understand that we have this bias. No one, no matter how creative you are, is exempt from this bias. Some people have just sort of realized that they're afflicted with it. And so we all have this bias. And when other people come to us with great ideas, it's really hard to, to take a step back to see the value of the new outside of the status quo. And this ties into that social environment that we talked about at the beginning of this webinar. It ties into the idea of how do we build a company with a social environment of creativity. The number one thing you can do is encourage people to try out their ideas. Because this mousetrap myth says that when people present an idea to us, we are uh, subtly biased against it. We say we want more out-of-the-box thinking. We don't actually want more out-of-the-box thinking. Because when it gets presented to us, we reject it. And the message that gets communicated when we reject those ideas and say, it'll never work, I've, this is how we've always done it before, et cetera, we send a message to our organization that it's just easier not to try to submit any new ideas. And over time, what ends up happening is all of the ideas that used to be coming out of all of our people uh, stop coming. 
And it's not because our people got less creative. It's just because we've sent a message that says we don't value those ideas. Even though we pay lip service to them, even though we say we value them, we don't value them, we won't let them try out. And so the greatest, the greatest most innovative leaders, the most innovative companies, they all allow for some level of risk taking, some level of letting the idea develop. Right? And, and letting, figuring out how much we can afford to lose and letting that idea develop before they make the judgment call on whether or not to implement the idea. Because they know that if they're just going off of the idea as it's first presented, it's probably not going to pass this mousetrap test. And so what we need is to get some, some, try, some experience with it, some feedback on how it worked, and make the idea better in a, an iterative process, like and make, getting feedback, making it better, getting feedback, making it better. Otherwise, we end up with just a, a lack of great ideas. And what I think is most interesting, most of the time when I get called into an organization or called into a, to give a talk at a conference, most often they, they call me because they say, we want our people to have more ideas. And the very first thing I say back to them is this mousetrap myth. This is the idea that you don't actually need more creative ideas. Most of us in organizations, most of us running companies just need to get better at recognizing the value of the ideas we're already coming up with, plugging them into a process like we've been talking about and allowing them to develop and get better. I believe truly that the, we have enough creativity in the world to solve all of the problems that our world faces. We just need to get better at recognizing the valuable ideas from the ones that are invaluable and implementing the ones that have value. Um, so with that, I know we, we had planned for uh, a little bit longer. We had some technical uh, difficulties in the, in the start, but I think it's a great time to go in and, and transition into some questions. Um, I know that you probably have some. I, I've been uh, teaching at a university level long enough to know that anytime you say anything, there are obviously questions. And anytime you have a question, it means somebody else in this webinar, somebody else in a classroom has it too. So please do not be afraid to share uh, your questions. Okay, thank you very much, David. Uh, folks, we are now open for the Q&A. You can put your question in the question box or you could raise your hand to speak directly to David. So uh, please raise your hand if you have any questions to, or if you want to speak directly to David. I noticed there are questions in the question box, so let me go straight to the question box. Uh, okay. Uh, in David, first one, in your view, what is more important? Is it how do you think or is it what do you think? Hmm. So it, it, I'm, I'm assuming then what do you think is being the level of ideas you come up with and how you think being the process. Yeah. Um, I would, if I had to pick, I would actually go with how. Um, the reason is that there's been some really interesting research into, in, into the brain. We tend to think of the brain as, uh, the human brain as this one big spongy thing full of information. And, and I remember when I was a kid, someone told me, and I was, I was young and dumb, so I believed it, every time you learn a new fact, you get a new wrinkle in your brain. Right? I, don't, I don't know how, how prevalent that is globally, but I was told that, and, and it's totally not true. Um, but the other thing is that there are, there are two types of material that make up the brain. One is called gray matter, and that is what you think. That is the literal facts and ideas that you have. And then the other is called white matter, which is the connections between um, all of those different ideas. And what's really interesting is if you study people who score really highly on tests of creativity, they tend to have more of the white matter. They tend to have a better ability to make connections among a variety of different ideas uh, than do people who score low on creativity tests. They, they tend to have not more gray matter because everybody has more gray matter, but they tend to have less white matter than their creative counterparts. The research actually supports that you can grow this white matter, that it's not something you're genetically just born with this amount and you get no more. Um, most researchers actually say you're born with a range and you can always get better inside of that range. But I like if I think of gray matter as what you think and white matter as how you think, I lean towards how you think. Because when it comes to creativity and innovation, it's not necessarily about um, the facts and ideas that you are able to memorize and regurgitate and spit back. It's about how you draw connections between those different ideas. And a lot of us, uh, especially in a, in a in a, a schooling system, in an education system, a lot of us get really, really good at remembering things and then being able to say them back, remembering facts and dates and figures and calculations and that sort of thing. I, I, I'm interpreting your question as those things are what you think. And interestingly, when you look at creativity and innovation, how you think, how you draw connections between all of that stuff, all of that what you think about becomes far more important. So I would lean towards how you think. But we don't spend a lot of time studying and learning how to think better, which I think is probably a shame. Well, thank you very much. Well answered. Uh, let me go to a caller who has raised his hand. 
We have uh, Brother Bender al -Tawbi. Brother, could you please unmute your microphone yourself because I have unmuted you, but it looks like that you have also mute microphone at your end. Uh, Brother Bander al -Tawbi, your microphone is unmuted. Okay, now we can perhaps hear you. Brother, can you speak up and please introduce yourself and ask a question? Yeah, my name is Bander al -Tawbi from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, thank you for, uh, Dr. David, thank you for your uh, webinar, thank you, Mr. Ali. My question is, I have been working on a project for the last six months. The project is writing feasibility study course material. So, uh, you mentioned the point, a very important point, when you leave what, what is at, at hand for a few minutes or for a few days, and you come back later, uh, then you have better idea, better creative idea about how to improve the work you are working on. I just want you to elaborate on this. Uh, when I leave, let's say, for a week, a month, I do feel that when I come back, I have better vision about the project at hand. Can you just elaborate on this a little bit? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and, and thank you for your question. It, it's it's great, and it actually it resonates. If you're working on um, feasibility study course material, it, it resonates truthfully with me and my writing because I've I've always given students uh, writing advice around uh, write something out and then put it in a desk drawer for a little while and then come back to it. Uh, the the evidence for for that suggestion comes from so Chick sent me high, and the five stages was the first person to um, to discover or to realize this sort of uh, incubation process. But then we've also done later studies in incubation that usually what they'll do is they'll have people come up with, um, they'll, they'll have people list a bunch of ideas, right? So they'll say common creativity research questions are things like they'll, they'll give someone a paper, quit, a paper clip and they'll say think of as many uses for this paper clip as you can. Uh, and it's a test of what's called divergent thinking, uh, which is one of the fundamental modes of thinking inside of creativity. And the, the, the test is in itself is not all that important in this case because what they'll do is different groups, they'll give different amounts of time and different activities during that time uh, of incubation. So to some they'll just say work constantly uh, for, for 10 minutes. For others they'll say work for five minutes, take a five minute break, then come back. And for others they'll say work for five minutes, then work, switch and work on this task, and then come back. And what they found in almost all of the studies is that people who work all the way through, they have less ideas, they have worse quality ideas than people who either take a break or switch and work on something else. And so I think this resonates with exactly what you were what you were talking with. Is as and what's interesting is it can be a month, like you had said, or it can be as little as five or ten minutes, uh, but you end up just being able to look at a situation with a fresh set of eyes and and subconsciously um, giving your mind to break from all of the pathways. I said earlier about gray matter and white matter, and if white matter is how you think, sometimes the most traveled pathways you end up thinking again and again, and you know in in um, Body mechanics, we call this muscle memory. In, in thinking, we call it memorization. But if your white matter knows a common connection that it uses all the time, a linking of facts, as it were, uh, it travels down that road more often. So what happens is you're working really, really hard on a project. Just like what you were saying, if you're working really hard on a project, your white matter memorizes that, that chain of, of thoughts, and it keeps coming back to it. And what it, we think is going on in this incubation period is that it's giving your brain a break from traveling down that path all the time and allowing new connections between new ideas and new facts that are in your brain to be made. And so it's, it's sort of, we metaphorically call this looking at it with fresh eyes, but the truth is we're looking at it sort of with a fresh brain. We're looking at it with a possibility to make connections between stuff we, weren't, we wouldn't have been able to see before because our brain was traveling down that same path. So you can do this in, in a writing process. You can do this by writing things out and then taking a break and coming back and returning to edit them instead of just plowing right through and reading it again. Um, but even in, in trying to come up with new ideas for a product and new ideas for a, a problem, what most people are finding is that if you spend, uh, e even I, when I do one-day seminars with companies and we go in and we work on a problem inside of that company and I'm always deliberate to make sure that we talk about all of the research behind the situation and get all of the facts and things that structure our problem we talk about all of that, and then we take a break. Either we get coffee, get tea, get lunch, whatever it is, and, and only after we've taken a break do we return and try and solve the problem. And the, the reason is that I want the brain as, as fresh as possible, as open to new combinations of ideas as possible so that we can have the best quality ideas. So you're, you're finding that the, the real challenge 
I think is working that into your everyday workflow, which varies depending on what, what people do professionally, um, but finding a way to stay productive while at the same time knowing that you're switching between your difficult tasks and your easy tasks so that you're giving your mind a little bit of a break between tasks. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Brother Brother. Do you have any supplementary questions or should we move to another caller? Uh, okay, Brother Brother Brother, I'll tell me I'm going to... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah just quick, uh, Dr. David, you mentioned that you uh, specialize also in feasibility studies. Can I, I don't know uh, if you can contact you later on about this. I don't want to... This this would have to be about it, but oh no! I, so I was I was um, I was making the connection between writing them and and doing um, my own sort of writing. I truth be told, I've only ever written one, and it didn't work out so well because we decided not to launch the company. So actually, maybe it did work out well. So because we decided to save our money and not launch the company. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. And brother, I believe uh, the contact details will be available uh, to you later on uh, of uh, David Borges. So let me move to uh, another question. There's one from uh, Heba Al-Hilali. The question is, from your opinion, what is the best way to boost creativity for graphic designers and marketers quickly? Hmm. I think this, the single best way is to look at the work of, that other people are doing. Um, you think back to that gray matter, white matter idea. If white matter and making connections between previous ideas uh, is is how we think and is most important for creativity, then the more raw material we have to make connections between, the better. So the more you're studying the work of other people, um, the more that you're opening up to not even studying the work of other graphic designers, but anything visual. The more that you're opening up, the more potential connections that are that are there. There's a um, there's a saying that's attributed to Picasso. Although truth be told, we can never we can't find this in writing anywhere. He said that good artists copy and great artists steal. And I think that really resonates with if you want to boost the number of ideas you have, you need more raw material of other people's ideas from which to play around and make combinations. So that would that would be my advice: is get out and and look to copy as much worth uh, much work as you can because you never know when you'll put it into some combination of something you're working on and boost it. Okay, another quick one. Uh, what is the best way to quickly assess creativity of an individual during a short interview, face to face? So, um, interestingly, we, we sort of already covered it. So that question about um, tell me as many uses for a, a paperclip as you can, it's a test of what's called divergent thinking. Usually, so there's essentially we have divergent thinking and convergent thinking. Divergent thinking is how many different avenues and ideas and, and pathways your mind can explore in a short period of time. Convergent thinking is sort of trying to find that one right answer. If I give you a problem and ask you mathematically to solve it, et cetera. Schooling systems are great at growing convergent thinking, and so grade point averages and test scores and where you went to school and all of those sort of things are great metrics in an interview to use on convergent thinking. But divergent thinking, we don't spend a lot of time developing in school. In fact, a lot of schooling actually cuts down on the level of divergent thinking because as you go further in school, the more you learn there's just one right answer um, and you need to remember what it is because you can't look in the book, that'd be cheating. So uh, I think one of the simplest ways, and I, I actually do this with some of my students uh, in the very beginning of a course that I teach on creativity, to get an idea of their creative ability, and then I give them a similar but uh, different object later down the road, is I'll ask them. I usually use a brick uh, because I think it's uh, more fun than a paperclip. But I will tell them, tell me, write down, I'll give you two minutes, write down as many uses for a brick as you can think. And everybody says things like paperweight, build a house, etc. Very few people think of it as, oh, you could use it as a pillow if you had nothing else, or you could use it to um, to break out of a car if you were stuck and, and trying to get out of a trapped car. Very few people go that far. Um, you don't need to look at the quality of ideas. The more ideas, the better, as a simple gauge for divergent thinking. So the more ideas, the better. Okay. Uh, go ahead and we can take one last question. What is the worst action as an organization can take to kill innovation or creative culture? So I, I think the, the worst thing that you can do is to limit the amount of risk taking you allow your people to, to engage in. So when you look at the most innovative companies, most of them have some some program in place. So at Google it's 20% time. At, um, at, 
uh, 3M, it was 15% time. It, at companies, tech companies like Facebook and Twitter, et cetera, it's hack weeks or hackathons. It's this idea of we're going to give you a limited period of time to try out your crazy idea and give it time. Right? Um, by contrast, what a lot of companies who don't even allow people to engage in new initiatives do is they communicate that we don't value your ideas because we're not even going to give you the resource of time to try it out in. So whatever you can do to communicate that you support uh, limited risk taking, that you support exploring new avenues, that you're not just when an idea is presented to you, you don't just reject it flat hand, you make it clear that you are willing to consider the merit of the idea but you want more feedback. Um, you want more research on it, that's, that sends the message that we value creative ideas and that will inevitably boost uh, creative ideas. In contrast, the thing that kills it quickly is, is cutting down ideas or, or shooting down ideas as soon as they come up because that communicates a message to everybody that you as a leader or you as an organization don't value it and it becomes easier just to stay in line and not submit those new ideas. Hey, well, thank you very much, David. That really brings us towards the end of the webinar. I would like to thank you on behalf of mine. And before we dismiss out, any concluding remarks that you would like to give? No, this was uh, really, really fun. Thank you again for, for having me. It's been a privilege to have, to have me. I, I love the way we were talking about Apple and tech and connectivity, and I love the way that that allows us to bridge whole worlds uh, and make this happen. So I'm privileged to be a part of this, so thank you so much. If, you, uh, if you're listening and you want to find out more about the book or about me, very simple website, davidberkus.com. If you go to that, there's a ton of different resources and, and audios, uh, files that you can watch, speeches you can watch about it. So there's all sorts of resources there. And all sorts of contact information for me. Um, so please, if you if anything sparked with you, get get a hold of me. I, I value everybody's ideas, and so I'd love to hear what ideas were sparked out of your listening to this. Well, thank you very much, Derek, once again, and thank you all of those who attended this webinar and posted interesting questions. Uh, folks, I've just broadcasted a link of our community.mind.org for where you can access uh, the previous webinar's recording. We are recording this webinar, which we will be updating on community.mile.org in a couple of days, so please stay tuned. With that note, I would like to thank everyone once again, so you all have a good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're calling from. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship, Mile.